Uh, good afternoon and welcome to the Instituto Cervantes of Manchester and Leeds. Uh, we are very happy to have you here tonight for the second lecture of this series, Acquiring a Second Language, Why Do We Find It So Difficult? Uh, throughout this series, as you know, our presenters will be discussing various elements and challenges that come with learning a second language, including myths and realities about language acquisition and age, the role of explicit knowledge in learning, the impact of education on our ability to learn a second language, and in today's lecture, the use of language in different contexts. Uh, this forum is aimed primarily at teachers, but also at language students, parents, and anyone interested in how we learn a second language. Before we begin, I'd like to express our gratitude to Anna Scott and Idoya Lola for coordinating this program, and very especially to Marta gonzalez Lloret today for her participation. Allow me first to introduce very briefly to our coordinators, Anna and Idoya. Uh, Dr. Idoya Lola received her doctorate in foreign language acquisition, research and education from the University of Iowa, and is now an associate professor in the Department of Classical and Modern Languages and Literatures in Texas Tech University. Dr. Anna Oskov is a professor at the University of Maryland, Baltimore County, where she teaches courses in Spanish and second language acquisition. She's currently a chair of the Modern Languages, Linguistics and Intercultural Communication Department, and is also co-editor uh, co of the Calico Journal published by Equinox. Now, Anna and Idoya will introduce our speaker, Marta gonzalez Lloret, who is Professor of Applied Linguistics at the University of Hawaii in Manoha. Hawaii was now, maybe you don't know, but it is 6.30 a.m., so our gratitude, uh, Marta, is double for uh, your lecture today and for your uh, madrugón. I don't know how you say that in English. <laughs> Um, just a, a quick reminder that there, there's translation, you have the option of uh, listening to this talk in, in uh, Spanish, you have the translation option in Zoom uh, down in the, in the bar, right? And also there will be, after uh, Martha's lecture, we have like 30 minutes for questions uh, and you will be able, well, it, it, we think it will be better if you can uh, ask your questions through the chat, right, through the, uh, during the lecture. So now, without further ado, I'll hand the floor over our two coordinators, uh, Anna, Idoya, floor is yours. All right, so good afternoon and good evening to, to everyone. Uh, we would like to thank the Instituto Cervantes Manchester and Leeds again for inviting us to coordinate this series and the audience for attending this talk today. Uh, the second speaker of this series is Marta González Lloret, a professor of Spanish Applied Linguistics in the Department of Languages and Literatures of Europe and the Americas at the University of Hawaii, Manoa. She's also an associate graduate faculty member of the Department of Second Language Studies at this institution. As you can see on her beautiful website, Marta, uh, she has published widely nationally and internationally on several topics, including computer assisted language learning, teacher education, L2 pragmatics and assessment. But her two main areas of interest um, are the intersection of technology and task-based language teaching and technology and L2 pragmatics. It is precisely technology and L2 pragmatics that will be the topic of her presentation today. In addition to the rigor and forward-thinking approach with which Marta conducts her research, there is another characteristic that permeates Marta's work, her generosity. Marta is a generous researcher who is always willing and eager to engage in conversation to move the field forward. And as you have heard, she has very diverse research interests, so you can imagine how much impact she is having in the field. Marta is also generous with her students, for whom she is a fantastic mentor. She has been recognized for inspiring the students and peers with several teaching awards. She's a genuine colleague who brings researchers together to advance the field, connects graduate students with accomplished researchers, and overall creates amazing environment everywhere she goes that makes everybody feel welcome. And without further ado, Marta gonzalez Lloret. Thank you, Anna. Thank you, Itoya. And thank you to the Instituto Cervantes Manchester Leeds. Can everybody hear me? Okay, good. Um, that was... Uh, a very sweet introduction. Thank you. I'm not sure it's all true, but it is uh, good to hear it. Thank you. 
All right, so um, today I would like to talk about the importance that pragmatics has when we educate language learners that are truly, truly communicative competent in another language in a variety of contexts. We know that uh, classrooms are a little bit of a poor context for interaction with different a variety of speakers. And uh, we are going to see in this presentation how we can extend that to um, other practices. Try the screen. So take a look at those two emails. And um, do you think they are um, equally effective on what they are asking? And if you want, you can answer in, in the chat. Um, but it's basically to bring up the idea that these two emails uh, seem a little bit different probably to all of us. One may seem a little bit more polite, a little bit more appropriate. And um, we can see that the first email, the address is by, you know, hula girl and three numbers, which, you know, who is that, right? Second one is actually, um, institutional email had the name of the person. The second one had a, a greeting that it's more appropriate. It has a far away. The first one was sent on a Sunday evening at 9.55 p.m. for an appointment the next morning. Um, the second one was sent during um, working time hours. So somehow when we read these emails, there are lots of little clues that make it seem a little bit more appropriate or a little, a little bit more polite. They're both from students. And actually the top one is from an intermediate advanced student and the bottom one is from a beginner student. So when we know that, that also makes us think of those students differently, right? We may think, oh my goodness, the first one then is, you know, kind of a little bit of rude maybe, right? All of these, all of these little clues are given by what we call pragmatics in a language. So pragmatics, according to Delheims, is knowing what to say, to whom, in what circumstances, and how to say it. So this is what we need if we want to have pragmatic competence. That means having the social pragmatics, understanding the social pragmatics of a community of speakers of a language that is the norms and principles of that language. Also knowing the pragma linguistics which are the linguistics realizations of those pragma lingua of those um, socio-pragmatic norms, and also be able to use it in an interactional way. Because when we interact with people, we need to be able to um, jointly construct the conversation and adapt to how the conversation may be changing so that we can do it in uh, interactional appropriate way and it's not just about how we use the language it's also about how we understand the language so actually being pragmatically competent also has to do with being able to understand not just what people say but also what people mean so fully understand a message right so if i see a little note that says I'll see you there at seven. The language is really simple, right? I'll, you know, probably we know it's I will and see and you there at seven. Nothing difficult about the language. But in order to understand its message, we need to know who is you, where is there, and also uh, seven in the morning, seven in the evening. So we need to know the context that surrounds a message. And the context is actually the most important concept in pragmatics. So the same conversation or the same speech act will change a lot depending on who the interlocutors are, what the relationship is in terms of familiarity, hierarchy, and knowledge between those interlocutors. Uh, also, where they share some cultural knowledge, some history, 
and uh, the cultural constraints of the uh, context where they are interacting. So we know, for example, that in some cultures, when a man and a woman interact, uh, it's very different from other cultures, right? Also the physical context. So a farewell is not the same in a building that under the rain, for example, right? Or a business is not closed in the same way in a boardroom or in a restaurant with a couple of tequilitas, right? And uh, the artifacts that we use in our um, interactions also mediate the way that we interact with other people. So the way that we handle a business car can affect the way that we interact with someone in a greeting. Or you can imagine that umbrella in a rainy situation. It is uh, very different if you're saying far away without an umbrella or with an umbrella under the rain. So understanding the complexities of a context and doing it in a fluid, dynamic way right when the interaction happens is quite difficult for language learners especially for those that do not have much contact with, uh, with much contact, sorry, with the target language or um, the cultures. So we can say, well, you know, something really simple like a greeting, we can tell our students, well, this is how you greet in a formal work environment. But that is not that simple. Not when we actually take into account all of the different nuances, all the relationships, all of the physical, the background context that um, happens in, in that greeting. So I'm going to tell you a personal story now. When I first came to the United States, um, I was working in a camp in Ohio, and I have very good knowledge of um, English grammar. I had done philology English. I had read Shakespeare, Faulkner, so I thought my English was pretty good. However, I spent the first couple of weeks looking at the ceiling of the sky every time someone said, what's up? I was looking up, people were looking at me like I was crazy, laughing at me. And this went on until someone told me that, you know, that was actually a greeting, not a question. That, pretty embarrassing. Um, that same summer, I went uh, with another camp counselor to visit their home. There's a second picture. And her mom offered us a piece of this beautiful chocolate cake. Um, I was very polite and I softly refused it, offering for her to insist to um, ask me again so I could accept because that is the pragmatic norm in uh, Spain. But there was no insistence. She just put the cake right back into the fridge and I had no idea what just had happened. It really left me very confused and very hungry. So you can see that I'm the only one without a plate in um, that uh, picture there. So to me, it's really clear that I would have benefit before I enter these interactions of some type of instruction that would have told me how informal US greetings work, um, how offers and acceptance work in this context. So that's me, no plate. So today, I hope to convince you that pragmatics is an essential component of communicative competence. And as language teachers, we uh, should be really invested in um, uh, making sure that students have enough instruction and enough access to pragmatics. Because as Jenny Thomas um, already said, if a beginner learner makes some language mistakes, it's usually attributed to a lack of language competence. But if an intermediate or a more advanced learner makes mistakes, they're usually attributed to their personality and they're considered rude, impolite, or unfriendly. And even worse, stereotypes are created about people that uh, make these kind of pragmatic mistakes. A few years back, um, we linguists thought that we could only learn pragmatics in a study abroad context and or traveling to, to the country and that this was something that only advanced students uh, could do. But now we do have several meta analysis aggregating a lot of research uh, results and it tells us that instruction actually helps developing pragmatic competence. And um, pragmatic instruction 
does help learning pragmatics. There's three things we can do as teachers to um, help with these um, acquire, uh, acquisition of pragmatics. We can first teach pragmatics, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that. Then we can also facilitate how the, our learners interact and practice those uh, pragmatics. And we need to fully integrate pragmatics in the curriculum. And I will talk about um, those three points. So um, from one of the recent, most, most recent meta-analysis um, by Plonsky and Swang, we know that um, instruction is effective. And this is across a variety of contexts, of demographics, of different treatments, different pragmatic targets, and also with different types of outcomes, so uh, in production and in comprehension. We also know that explicit instruction seems to be more effective than implicit instruction, although there may be an effect on how we test these things, so that one is not so clear yet. We know that effective instruction is most effective when it comes uh, accompanied by feedback, and we also know that the most effective is having instruction with opportunities for practice, for practice and also with feedback. There are different types of activities that we can bring to the classroom. Uh, we have what we call awareness raising activities where we can uh, integrate different pragmatic features, depending what we want to teach. It can be a speech act, or it can be um, a recognition of inference. Um, it can be phrases, indirect language, humor. There, there are many different things and different types of activities to address them. Um, even for things like silence. So most people don't think of silence as something that needs to be taught. But if I cross a colleague in a corridor and I say, good morning, and this person clearly sees me but does not answer, just looks at me and says nothing, that silence says a lot. And we need to um, teach students how to react to these types of situations. So including silences, right? Um, also things like uh, transition relevant places. So when a person is talking in a conversation, especially a multi-party conversation and someone is going to take the turn, that is space that is between turns. It's very different in different languages. In Spanish is really short compared to English, for example, and other um, cultures. So our students usually say, Oh, but you know, it, there's like three, four people. I can, I can never say anything. They never let me say anything in these conversations. It has nothing to do with their level of language, nothing to do how grammatically appropriate uh, they are or how accurate they are. It's got, to, it's got to do with knowing when you can take the turn in a conversation. So through these types of activities, we can help our students um, to understand how these norms work and we can practice so that when they come to the real moment, they can actually say something in a conversation. So some of these activities, uh, like awareness raising activities, it's basically talk about, you know, how the culture works, how people do what they do and why they do it this way and how we can actually uh, be part of, of those, those um, dialogues. Uh, we can explain metalinguistically or metapragmatic what things happen, right? Same as we do some metalinguistic explanation of verbs or, you know, other, other um, language um, rules. We can watch videos that identify what happens, talk about it. We can discuss certain scenarios and we can do them ourselves in role play situations. And one of the ones that is most interesting to me is we can talk to other speakers of the language in control environments where students can, can practice their uh, pragmatics. And we'll talk more about that. So 
this talking to other speakers is what we call facilitating pragmatic development. So, of course, we can go study abroad, and study abroad is the most um, um, obvious place to, to practice language. But um, we know from research, actually, that if a study abroad does not provide plenty of opportunities with different speakers in a variety of contexts and purposes, it may not be as um, useful as we think that the study abroad um, is. So also for those students that cannot afford to go study abroad, time, family uh, situations, money, yeah, there are other alternatives. And digital spaces, so technology here, is a great opportunity for engagement with other speakers for pragmatic practice. So there are lots of synchronous and asynchronous situations where students uh, can practice their pragmatics. And this is probably one of the main potentials of technology, the idea that it can connect our learners with either other speakers or with technologies that will serve them as speakers also, like um, simulations, for example. We'll talk a little bit more. Um, I would like to point out some that have been developed specifically for the teaching or the research of pragmatics, and some of them for Spanish, like this one. This is Croquelandia. It was designed by Julie Sykes a while ago, 2008. And it was the first space that was created for learners of Spanish to practice apologies and refusals. So the students go around in this environment and things happen to them. They miss an exam, they break a base in a market, and they had to actually um, apologize, which is a very face threatening um, speech act, actually, and very difficult to do for a student. So when the first time um, happens in real life, it is really, really um, a, a, tra a traumatic experience, I would say. Um, more recently, we have Quest Questa Rant, which was designed to teach Chinese formulaic language. In this game, um, this, this environment, the learner plays the role of a robot, and a robot needs to interact with different customers to complete several tasks, and like I was saying, it was designed for formulate language, but there's a lot of pragmatics involved in it. If you're interested in games, I would invite you to visit the University of Oregon Center for Applied Second Language Learn Language Studies. They have a great website and they have a lot of different um, games, uh, like Buscando a, a Good Man is uh, they're super interesting and they target pragmatic development specifically. We also have place-based games, and these, uh, in these uh, type of uh, context and environments, students interact with a mobile device, a phone or a tablet, and they have to complete several tasks. In, uh, we have Mentira, which is for Spanish students. They had to solve a mystery in an Albuquerque, an Albuquerque neighborhood and they would go to this neighborhood called Los Griegos, and they would interact among themselves and with the device. And the characters in this device would give them better and or not so good answers to solve this mystery, depending on how polite the students' choices were when they uh, selected the answers to the questions for the students. Uh, for the characters in the game or, you know, the questions that they would ask of these characters in the game. It was all written, but there were different choices and these choices were more or less polite. Um, other examples are Paranormal Pragmatics in Montreal or Chronops developed by the 503 Design Collective at Portland. And, you know, I would invite you to uh, visit them if you're interested in this type of games. Um, one of the newest technologies that have been explored for pragmatic development is the use of simulations. These are based on spoken dialogue systems. And um, in these simulations, usually learners interact with a computer. 
it could be on a desktop or it could be on a VR with glasses. And they usually complete a task that emphasizes a pragmatic feature, such as register or most of them politeness. And um, the research is actually advance, advancing pretty rapidly and is starting to incorporate also uh, voice recognition because voice recognition systems are getting better with non-native language. So um, in some of these simulations, the students talk to the computer or talk within the environment, and then the um, simulations will give them choices or will talk back uh, to them according to how pragmatically appropriate they were um, in doing their requests or their invitations, et cetera. And um, one of the main advantage of these uh, technology simulations is that they're able to give very consistent individualized feedback. Very consistent and very individualized. This is really difficult to do in language classrooms. So when we have really big classrooms, these can be great additions to um, our in-class teaching. Uh, finally, I want to introduce to you now, this is a humanoid robot and it was used in uh, to teach thanking and requests to Persian uh, schoolers, preschoolers, so really young, to uh, learn English. So um, you can say that, you know, science fiction, it's a lot closer than that what we think. And of course, in language teaching and education, we're far behind um, other subjects like medicine, right? They got all the money. So, uh, but we are progressing. And there is a, a lot of uh, different uh, technologies that can be used for facilitating uh, student engagement with pragmatics. The third thing that I said we could do, the first one was teaching, the second one was facilitating. The third one I think is really important is to fully integrate pragmatics in the curriculum. So regardless of how you facilitate the pragmatics or how you teach them, I think it's really important that um, the pragmatics are fully, fully integrated in the curriculum. So pragmatics shouldn't be something that we do, you know, the first Friday of the month or something like that. If we want the students to understand how important pragmatics are, and I hope to have convinced you a little bit of how important they are. You can have a per perfect grammar, you can be perfectly fluent, but if you are pragmatically inappropriate, you're not gonna get that job, right? Or you're not gonna make that friendship. So pragmatics are essential, and the students need to understand that they are essential, not just by explaining it to them, but they need to see that it is important because it, it is part of the curriculum, including assessing students on how they are developing their pragmatic competence. So the same that we evaluate whether they are learning culture, whether they are improving their language structures, uh, their vocabulary, there also has to be emphasis and assessment on pragmatics. So, Fully integrating pragmatics in the language uh, curriculum means that we have to do it at every single step of the curriculum. So something as, as common as, you know, Paul and Mary that meet to uh, want to have a meeting according to their syllabus or their uh, curriculums or their um, schedules, right? It's a very common activity that we do in communicative language learning, right? So we have Mary with her schedule, Paul with her, her his schedule, and we, they have to find a time to meet. Well, we can start by defining who are Paul and Mary. What is their relationship? Are they friends? Are they uh, mother and daughter? Are they boss and uh, employee, right? In what context are they discussing this schedule? Are they gonna meet for lunch or is this a board meeting with other people in, um, affected? So bringing the pragmatics of those situations ma makes pragmatics real and makes the discussion a lot more real. So one of the most natural ways to incorporate pragmatics in my point of view is through task-based methodology. So if you use a task-based type of approach to your teaching, 
pragmatics are already incorporated in the same way that vocabulary or language structures are. Uh, we provide focus on form on them. That means when students need to know more about it because they're not understanding, because they're not using it correctly, we can uh, explain metapragmatically what we are seeing or metalinguistic what we are seeing. We can even do a little bit of activities with it. And we can create pedagogic tasks that actually directly address those social cultural norms or the appropriate language that it is needed to bring them to realization. So since communication cannot be understood independently from the pragmatic knowledge, we need to know a little bit what communicative situations the students are going to be in when they finish our classrooms or when they graduate from our projects, uh, program, sorry. So uh, needs analysis is a great way to understand what is that students are going to need, not just what they want, which is also important, but also what will they need. And this also should include what, in what context are they going to use the language? I mean, what are the participants' behaviors and the social pragmatic uh, norms of whatever the students are going to be using the language? Um, also, what pragmatic linguistic choices? How do people talk, especially for Spanish, right? Where we have such a large variety of Spanishes and different norms of different communities. Now, when it comes to assess metapragmatic, um, uh, pragmatics, we can assess the metapragmatic knowledge the same way that we do their grammatical rules or their cultural knowledge, or even better, we can integrate it in performance-based assessment. So this means evaluating everything about the language. It means assessing whether students can do a task and the speech acts that are involved in that task and whether they can do it fluently, their level, right? Depending on the level of the student. What kind of language are they using? Again, depending on the level. So the same student can perform a task at um, a beginner level, but the, the uh, language that we would expect from them is not the same that that same task, but at an advanced level, right? So the complexity of the language the vocabulary use, the accuracy which where they are using the language, and of course the appropriateness that they are using, they're performing this, this task or this speech act. This would include their level of politeness, whether they're using the necessary speech acts, no more, no less, right? Whether they are done adequately, also they're using the same, the correct register that they need and any other resources, either linguistic or non-linguistic, right? We need to be able whether students can greet people in an appropriate way, right? If uh, the need of these students is they're going to go to Spain, well, they need to understand how people kiss with, uh, people kiss in both cheeks, right? But that may not be appropriate in all contexts. So also nonverbal communication is very important. So, by assessing the students in this way, we know just what, not just whether they're able to order a meal at a restaurant, but whether they can do it in a respectful, appropriate manner, and also within the context and the social norms of that community um, of speakers. So our goal should not just be educated, better tourists or you know, better employees, better business partners, but also to break stereotypes that have been created before. So, you know, other successful, uh, unsuccessful cross-cultural interactions create stereotypes. And I think ethically as language teachers, part of our responsibility is to break those stereotypes and pragmatics can help with that. So um, a few final thoughts here. Um, I would like to point out that understanding the pragmatics of a culture community does not mean that we want or have to adopt them. So we now have a little bit of research that demonstrates that uh, some learners actually understand the rules. They do know the language that it is necessary to uh, perform those rules. But for example, as a Western woman speaking Japanese, 
they do not want to sound like a Japanese woman. They do not want to sound different from men, for example. Or they do not want to produce white lies to save face, like it will happen in this context, right? So knowing the norms, understanding the, the culture does not know that we actually want to adapt, adapt them. And um, this is important when we think about um, uh, assessment also, right? Because if we assess, a stu assess a students and they don't perform it like we expected, we have to somehow ask whether this has something to do with identity and agency. So there has to be different ways of understanding how students use pragmatics in a second language. So um, I hope that up to here, um, I make clear that, you know, integrating pragmatics in the curriculum, right? It's uh, very, very important. What we want is to help uh, learners develop essential component of communicative competence. And those essential components are the linguistic and social cultural knowledge required to interact appropriately, their interactional ability to be flexible in the way that we interact and change according to how the context and the interaction evolves. And also knowing, um, having agency to make informed decisions or whether or not they want to implement that knowledge that they have into the community, into the interaction at that moment. Hopefully through pragmatic instruction, our learners become what we call reflective ethnographers of the target language and cultures so that they can apply their new knowledge, their new abilities to every new task they encounter, to every new interaction they have. So um, they can take with uh, pleasure and appropriateness their journey as lifelong Spanish language learners. Thank you. Thank you very much, Marta. That was a very inspiring talk uh, about pragmatics that we always need to learn a little bit more how to act in the other language when we are in, interacting with other speakers. Uh, now is the time for questions. Um, please use the chat uh, to ask uh, questions to Marta. Don't be shy. As we said in introduction, Marta is very generous with her time and <laughs> she shares her knowledge. And it's totally appropriate to ask questions. Questions. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have one just to break the ice. Well, first, uh, Marta, thank you for the presentation. It's always, like Anna has said, inspiring to, to, to hear this other side of, of language that some, many times we don't talk about. We are always so concerned about learning the language correctly or having the correct grammar that we just forget how to use it and, and, and all that. I, I have a question that I hope is not moving too far away from your talk, but um, I, while you were talking, I was just thinking that when we're talking about pragmatics, in a way we think that it's only um, one speaker from one country learning a language from another country. But right now with, with the computer, you know, with this global communication, I mean, even if we think of English as an international language, people that are not native speakers of English that are connecting with, with one each other from many different languages, what is the, the role of pragmatics in a, in a setting in which doesn't really follow this kind of a dichotomy of, of cultures, you know, it's not just, you know, someone from the US or from the UK going to Spain, for example, but people communicating from many, many countries. How, how do we address these issues of multilingualism in a way? Yes, and I would even go a little bit farther. Pragmatics are important even within the same language. So we have so many Spanishes Right, and um, so many different pragmatic norms in different Spanish countries, so many different pragmalinguistics, right? When do you use vos, when do you use vosotros, right? Some of those, you know, get touched upon in, in classes, but 
a lot of the, the rules and when you do it and when you don't do it, and when you do it as a foreigner and you don't do it as a foreigner, right? Um, it's also part of pragmatics. Mm -hmm. So I, I think for me, that's why it's essential to train students to observe, to understand, to ask questions, right? And um, to be you know, ethnographers in themselves, understand that every culture, every person, every interaction comes with some pragmatic norms. Mm -hmm. So for them to be aware of it, you know, in lingua franc, Spanish as a lingua franca, in multi, uh, multi, multi pluripragmatic pragmatics <laughs> interactions, right? If you have someone that is Chinese, some other speaks Spanish, someone Indian, someone that is very normal, right? Right now, well, we need to learn to. Once we know that pragmatics are involved, we start being a lot more appropriate. Just because we're stopping and thinking, right? We are not the you know patoso Spanish that goes kissing everybody when everybody just goes like, "Whoa, where are you going?" Right? So um, just reflecting and knowing that other people have other pragmatics. It's, mm -hmm. It opens the world to, to students, I think. Mm -hmm. So yeah, in any interaction, it's just not, you know, dual one-to-one, -one, one way, the other way. It works for every interaction and also within languages and within cultures also. Mm -hmm. There is a question in the chat from Fatima. Uh, thank you very much for your talk. I would like to know your opinion about first years in primary or earlier. Can pragmatics be taught in a foreign language through explicit instruction with very young learners? Mm -hmm. um, yes, the, the short answer is yes. Uh, that um, when I talked about now, the humanoid robot, that uh, it's actually a, a, a really interesting, I'll be happy to, to share the, the reference with you, is by uh, the authors are Minou and Naf um, Nafiche, uh, they're uh, 2020. And um, these were uh, five-year-olds, so they were preschoolers learning requests and re learning thanking. And they had two groups, one was learning with a robot and one was learning just in a more traditional uh, classroom. They both learn. So, but interestingly enough, the ones with the robot learn more. So can young people learn? Yes. And I think personally, I think even more, right? When we acculturate kids to a language, a lot of what the parents do are pragmatics, right? You receive a present and what is that your mother says the first thing? What do you say to that? Que se dice? Oh, gracias. That's pragmatics, right? We are we are um, teaching kids to be uh, polite, to understand, register, right? Um, I I was a kid that talked a lot, so I heard a lot from my mother. Cuando los adultos hablan, los niños se callan. I heard that so many times. That has to do with register, right? I mean, they are our herd kids, and you have to respect them. And as a kid you can and you cannot interact with others in certain situations. So we do that for kids and kids learn it naturally within a society. So can they learn it? Yes, and I think it's actually the best time for them to learn it. Can I give an example of a metapragmatic explanation? Yes, so a metapragmatic explanation would be similar to what we say explaining some uh, a grammatical feature, right? So uh, in, in grammar, you say, well, you know, the past tense in Spanish, you have preterito, you have imperfecto, you use preterito for actions that are completed, da, da, da. you use imperfecto for actions, for feelings, blah, blah, blah. So that would be a grammatical explanation. So metapragmatic explanation is to say, well, you know, in Spain, we use vosotros with the third person, uh, second person plural form, right? While in the rest of the countries, you use ustedes, in Argentina, you use vos, and you get the second form of the verb in present in a different uh, form, form, right? You say sabes, tenes. <clears throat> that would be give it a metapragmatic explanation, means a full explanation of how the, this works. In order to be polite when you meet someone in uh, Spain, you greet each other using como estas, if it is a higher register, Que pasa if you're meeting a friend, 
you give two uh, kisses, woman to woman, woman to man, but men to men, not so much. Maybe you, you know, a palmadita en la espalda, or, you know, you shake hands. So explaining those things, that's a metapragmatic explanation. Thank you, Marta. We have another um, uh, question from Jesus Hernandez, who thanks you for the inspiring presentation. And is asking whether you can provide further information about the role of agency within the pragmatic context. Yes, um, agency is one of the things that have been studying uh, most recently. So um, eventually people realize that, yeah, you can know the pragmatics of a place, but you may not want to involve in those pragmatics, right? Students need to learn that that's a possibility also. So it's not, this is what you have to do and you have to do it, right? There is agency in pragmatics. I may be a person that is introverted and I will not want to greet people by kissing. I just refuse to do it, right? Okay, that's fine. But you need to understand what the repercussions are, right? You're gonna see probably maybe as impolite, you're gonna hear someone that says, hey, uh, where are my kisses? You need to be able to react to it, right? So the idea is that students understand that they are who they are and they may want to engage or not engage in these practices, but that has also some implications and teach them how to deal with those implications. So um, it's one of the most interesting actually um, topics in pragmatics right now, you know, identity and, and agency. How do you behave when you know but you don't want to do. I don't know if I answer. I'll be happy to provide you with references. I kept references very much to a minimum because, you know, um, we teachers don't want to hear references so much. So, but I'll be more than happy to um, anybody uh, give. Uh, my email was in the last, I can put it in the chat also. And I'll be happy to give references to anybody that wants more on a topic. Hay otra pregunta eh, de Silvia Novo eh, en español. A mí me parece una de las asignaturas más interesantes en filología. Como estudiante me interesó el tema de la cortesía, pero vi que había pocos artículos de investigación sobre el tema en lengua española. Están creciendo los estudios en pragmática, nos aportan muchos datos sobre los hablantes. Eh, sí, sigue creciendo, como cualquier tema sigue creciendo. El español va un poco, oh, sorry, I just switched it. Um, it keeps growing. Spanish goes uh, a little bit behind. Um, most of the student, uh, most of the studies that had to do with politeness and um, have to do with cross-cultural communications. So what happens when, you know, two different cultures meet or oh, Spanish and British, you know, how do we do things different? And, uh, but yeah, there's, there's quite a few uh, studies by now. There's actually some books dedicated to Spanish pragmatics already. So again, I'll be happy to send you uh, references if you write to me. We have another question from Charlene Sa. Uh, so pragmatics is related to culture and culture is related to identity. Sometimes it's not easy for foreign students to adapt to new cultures and therefore to new pragmatics, perhaps because they are afraid of losing their own identity. Which approach do you think is best to convince those students of the importance of learning and paying attention to pragmatics? Um, I always think that the students are smart people. So I always start by just talking to them and. Uh, showing them maybe a few situations where, you know, people are being impolite or people are just not following the pragmatics and what happens in those cases, right? And then I think as long as they understand what it's implied, if you do not follow the pragmatics, then um, is their choice, right? Is their choice to go one way or the other? they are going to be understood. If their language is good, that's the difference, right? If, if they decide, well, I'm not gonna conjugate the verbs and I'm just gonna go with infinitive. I just don't want to, right? It's, I don't want to. So, okay, they'll still be able to, to communicate. Now, if they're going to a job interview 
and they decide not to use any tenses and do everything in, in infinitives, do you think they're gonna get the job if that job requires to talk to people? I would say most likely not, right? So as long as they understand that what they do with the language has consequences for them and for others, um, I think it's you know a little bit up, up to them to use it. I think the first time that you know someone um, goes abroad and gets in a situation where you know they lose a lot of face or you know uh, they really are embarrassed, then it really becomes um, real for them. Right? And I think you know any any teacher that has taken students abroad has these these kind of anecdotes, right? I just use my own because I didn't want to use any of my students, but um, they're full of them. And I was so embarrassed when someone told me, why are you looking at me? This is a question. And I'm like, oh, sorry. <laughs> you know. So um, yeah, I think talk to them, show them examples. So I have a, I think it's a comment more than a question. Um, I really like how you have made us think of teaching pragmatics in the activities that we are doing every day in our classes, like uh, finding a time to meet, looking at the different schedules that you mentioned. When we look at, uh, we have to look at the context who the interlocutors are, what's the relationship, are their friends and their mother and daughter, the shared knowledge that exists, the cultural constraints, the, the physical context, the artifacts which is sounds very good to look at everything but at the same time i find it can be a challenge for l2 instructors how do you think we can approach that in our everyday life when we are already busy preparing the classes and we're already busy trying to do assessment and also assessing the, the l2 pragmatics how do you think the instructors can go about that do you have any tips any clues well, I think you don't have to do everything in one activity. I think, you know, it's when you're doing, you know, Paul and Mary discussing their schedule, um, you can just choose a situation for them, right? And say, oh, and by the way, Paul and Mary are, you know, boss and employer. And then, you know, they're negotiating the, the, their schedules. And then I personally do focus on forms. So I would let them start doing it, right? And either at the end or in the middle, or I would say, oh, okay, wait, wait, would Mary talk like that? Or would Paul talk like that to her, to his boss? It's like, really, do we talk like this? It's like, no, cuando puedes? No, yo no puedo. Well, that it's okay in language, right? But it's not really okay. So bringing those things as part of the feedback, once you put the situation, and you don't have to do 20 others with Paul and Mary, that's it. But the next time you do another one, you give them a little bit more of a challenge and you say, okay, you know, we're, um, we're just having um, an activity where, you know, two students are going together and buying bread, but they're in a food truck, it's raining. How do you do this? Okay, so it's a lot faster probably than if it's not raining. And then, okay, well, if it's not raining, what other language could we also do? Maybe a longer greeting, you wanna ask more things. So do like one or two variations when you do the activities it's just five more minutes in your class. It's as a teacher, be thinking of who are Paul and Mary every time you do something. It's like, who are these people? So trying to contextualize books. It's very sad, but books are very decontextualized in that mm -hmm. sense. You know, yeah, there may be a little square on the side that says, in Argentina, they use boss. Okay, yeah, but not everybody, not in every context. You're giving a talk at a university. You're not going to use boss. You're going to use to one ustedes, right? So contextualize things a little bit more. An assessment, I don't think it has to be very difficult either. All you need is one more line in your rubric that says appropriateness. That's it, right? You're, you're evaluating already on the language. So are they using the vocabulary, right? Are they doing the structures that they need to do if you're doing a, a oral conversation with them, right? Just one more line that says, are they appropriate or did they greet and have a farewell, right? So um, I think if you put it in your rubric, you see it and then it makes sense that they are doing it. And of course, when you practice with them in class, you're also gonna emphasize, right? 
okay. uh, a lot of the oral assessment is usually two students talking to each other. They sit and they go, yo en mi, di, en mi rutina diaria, voy, hello, no, hola, como estas, me llamo, nothing, right? If we're trying to emulate some time of role play, we need to do the whole package. We need to start with the beginning and end with the end, right? So understanding that that's how a conversation happens is not only good for assessment, it's good for their practice for real life so that they get to a shop and they don't go, you know, in, in Spain, it would be okay to say dos cafés when you enter a bar, but not so much in Mexico, right? You would need to start with buenos días, como estamos, right? Me pone dos cafecitos. So um, it's important to understand, especially for Spanish, that variety every time we do an activity. I think, Marta, you were using one expression that I'm going to use it from now on, the reflective ethnographer. Um, and you just you were just talking about the coffee, and, and I'm sure many of the people in the audience have had experiences like that, that we've, I remember in Seville, uh, in a study abroad program, we're teaching about how to order the breakfast. And so we took them to a bar and, you know, one by one was going in, and we have to, taught them things like, me puede poner un café, you know, un cafecito. Well, and so one of my students ran out and said, you know, Idoya, that man only said, café, no me pone nothing. Like that. So in that particular moment, that was a reflective ethnographer. I mean, and that happens more, like you were saying before, more easily in, in a study abroad program, because then they can see the contrast between what we might teach is more formally and what they encounter with the day-to-day -day life of, of the Spaniards. And so I, I like the, the comment that you said, reflective ethnographers. I think that it, it helps a lot to understand what they're going through. And you can do that with videos in class, for example, right? So you can put, you know, I mean, we're not short of uh, media, right? That's something we're not short of. So you can, you can have a different video in different Spanish countries of how people order a coffee, for example, right? Talk about the differences and then, you know, okay, well, if you're going to Mexico, you know, if you're going to Spain or, you know, if you're just learning them, but you can learn both. There's no reason why you shouldn't learn both and, and be more appropriate. I mean, in, in Spain, if you start by, por favor, me pone, by the time you are in, me pon, the guy's gone. Either you go and say dos cafes con leche or you don't get anything, right? And that is the real language, right? Our, our mission as teachers is to teach language that is useful, that is practice that they're going to use. Mm -hmm. Not just that it's informal. I mean, these students may have to give a presentation at the university and that it's also very formal. So, but things that are real. And that's why I think the needs analysis are so useful too. Who are our students, right? What, where are they gonna use the language? What are they gonna do with it? We have another question from Ellen. Do you have any advice for those who have difficulties with the way of talking slash speaking? In my case, I have difficulty with the exaggerated way of mm -hmm. speaking. How would I solve this? Um, I'm not sure I understand in the exaggerated way. Um, yeah, maybe Ellen, can, can you give us a little bit more context? Exaggerate meaning we use the hands or, I mean, exaggerated in comparison to what would be the norm. We're talking here British students. Maybe Ellen, let's. Maybe, Ellen, if you are here, maybe you can unmute yourself for a second. I see I see her name. There she is. Yeah. Um, so I was mostly talking about the way that they were talking, like, oh, the food was so good and it was perfect. It was fantastic. And, well, I'm a Dutch speaker. Um, a native Dutch speaker, so for me, it doesn't come naturally at all. Clear case of cross-cultural communication, right? The, the different uh, things. 
as a teacher, I think, you know, if it's not natural to you, you could use resources to show what, you know, uh, native speakers or expert speakers do, right? So you could use TV shows, you could use um, YouTube videos to actually, you know, show what it happens and then talk about it to your students because most likely your students are also Dutch speakers, right? So they are going to um, also have a difficulty doing that. And here's where the identity comes again, right? It's not bad if you are in a restaurant in Spain or you know, you're know in a host family and you say, oh, the, the food was good, rather than, oh, the food was so good, right? Um, but you're missing something. Now, if you decide to do it and you know what you're missing, then that's okay. But I think your students need to understand what's the difference. And if you don't want to do it, then show videos. Even better, get your students engaged in a telecollaboration with some students in Spain for you know two, three, four classes and get them to ask it. Why do you speak like that? What do you say like that? You know, can you help me decide when I should be using these expressive ways and when I should not? And then get it from the uh, speakers themselves. Did that help? Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you. Mm -hmm. We uh, have an another question from Sylvia. Do you want to read it, Idoyam? I think I interrupted you. Oh. Um, it's not too difficult. Is it not too difficult for beginners to get to get be aware of the right register of the language? For me as a teacher, I had a problem in school saying to the students, shut up instead of silence, please. I had no clue of that wrong way of saying. It was rude, but I didn't know it. Um, I don't think it's too difficult for beginners. And, and here, you know, I don't know what age students are. You know, older students have experience in life, right? So understand things that are uh, polite and impolite that we require register when we talk to people because every language there are things that are pragmatic universals right politeness is a pragmatic universal how we do it is different registers are a pragmatic universal every language has registers what the registers are who we hierarchically higher and lower that is different right so if they're adults then they understand those hierarchies and they understand the concepts so all we need to do is show them examples of how to do these things, right? And um, one, acti and one awareness activity that is, is very useful, useful is a scales, right? So from, I would need you to, um, what was your example? Um, silence, please, to shut up, right? There are other ways to say it, and there are more polite ways, and there are more rude ways, right? Shut the F up, right? It's, a, it's more rude. And then we have something like, uh, we would require fully, fully silence at this event, maybe more polite, right? So get the students to do scales yeah. of speech act, whatever it is, asking for silence in this case, right? And discuss, why is this more polite? Why is it, what, what other language can we use? If we put a please, does it make it more polite? Or maybe, you know, it's not polite at all. So a please will not do anything, right? So these scales of politeness are good for people to understand. Identity-wise, then you use whichever you think is appropriate, right? But knowing which one to use with whom in what context is what students need to know. And I wouldn't say there is a wrong way of saying things. It's just um, in that context, it's just not appropriate, right? No, no os creo que es una pregunta, pero había un comentario de Ed González. Uh, and if they see the rubric, they also realize the relevance of pragmatics across the production. As said earlier, the rubric is another way to make it explicit. Mm -hmm. Totally agree. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. That's why I was saying, you know, make it full part of the curriculum. Because the student, if I mean, why do students think that grammar is important? Because we teach a lot of it, right? Why is vocabulary important? Because we teach a lot of it, right? So um, 
students will not think that it's important. Students will not pay attention to it if it is not fully integrated. If the teacher doesn't think it's important, then why would the students think it is important? If the instructions in the book never talk about these things, why would they think it is important? So mm -hmm. the more exposure that they have, and definitely the rubric is a, a big thing, right? This is what you need in order to get the grade that you need. This is what's important, mm -hmm. right? So yeah, totally, totally agree with it. Mm -hmm. Since I don't see any questions, I'm gonna jump in again because I'm curious about something. Uh, one of the things that you comment, uh, Marta, was the non-linguistic resources as well. Uh, you were talking about gestures, um, but also I was just thinking about now that we're all texting and chatting, that we're using all these emoticons or whenever we have to create, a, for example, a PowerPoint and we're putting images and things like that. How do we do with pragmatics in non-linguistic context or with no linguistic resources? Right. So... Um... I think, you know, again, doing comparisons with your target, with your own language is an important thing, right? So students understand what some gestures are, right? They can see people doing, performing gestures and understanding what it means. When I came to Hawaii and everybody was doing this, I'm like, why do they want me to call them on the phone? I don't know them, right? And, you know, it's like, that's a greeting, right? But you need to know that that's a greeting. So there's there's lots of different stories and different um videos that you can use. There's a dictionary of Spanish um, language symbols, you know, um, embodiment that is really useful too, right? Students can see how you say goodbye, what does, you know, this mean, or, you know, what does this mean? So gestures, are, it's, it's, a good, it's a good thing. Um, practicing those things in role plays, right? In classroom is like, okay, tell me something, but don't use your language use your nonverbal language, right? Tell me something. And then see if the rest of the students can figure out what it is that they are trying to say, right? Gaze is another thing that is super different in different cultures, right? It's, um, you know, where do you look at people when they're speaking? In some countries, you cannot look directly at the eyes. In others, you have to look directly at the eyes, right? So um, if we're talking about Spanish, what does the Spanish world do? Where do you look at people when you talk? Every time you talk to people, that's important. I mean, if you think about something that can be more important than that, what is it? You know, a vocabulary word, a grammatical feature. This is every time you engage with someone. You have to look somewhere, and that place has to be appropriate, right? In some places, you cannot look past here, <laughs> right? I mean, it's, it's, it's got to be appropriate. And we don't think about teaching these things. But cross-culturally, if they are, I mean, if they're the same, then fine. But if they're different, that, that is important. We have a comment from Silvia following something that you said. Uh, okay, no siempre es fácil para los hablantes darse cuenta del significado implícito del vocabulario. I think we all have been there. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, Inference, it's one of the most difficult things to do for um, everybody. Language learners, for language learners, it's really, really difficult. But also um, for, for native speakers, for expert speakers, um, because it's something also very personal, right? We always have, I think everybody has that friend that never gets the hints, right? has nothing to do with the language. It's got to do with how that person is able to infer what we mean, right, in, in indirect language. But we can't tell the person, you know, um, I meant this, right? Or for students, they require a lot of work to understand inference. But it can be learned. There are several uh, studies that say that, you know, students get exposed to, um, made phrases to refranes to things like that, they start understanding that language has an implicit meaning, that what we say sometimes is not exactly what we mean, right? And that when someone tells you, como estas, is a greeting, they don't want you to give them an entire 
uh, an entire narration of your life and how you are in that moment. It's not the case. If it is your friend and they are asking you how you are feeling as a question, then you have to answer. But if it is someone at the elevator that you don't know and they say, oh, como esta? That's a greeting. So you just say, bien, or oh, estupendo, or whatever. You can lie, it's okay, right? <laughs> Light is part of pragmatics, right? <laughs> so as a greeting, it's not a question. So mm -hmm. understanding those things are difficult for some people that are native speakers. I totally agree, not everybody gets it. But if we explain students how it works, hopefully, <laughs> most of them will will get it but yeah totally agree with that mm -hmm. marta i have a question i hope it makes sense do you think that it could be useful to make students aware of how pragmatics work in their own language before teaching them pragmatics in l2 so as a tool for teaching them pragmatics in l2 uh, somehow making a student a reflective reflective ethnographer that I, I like that term as well very much but a reflective ethnographer of its own language first. Mm -hmm. Yes, totally. I think it's um, it's pretty much impossible to teach the pragmatics of another language without making the comparisons, right? Mm -hmm. So when you explain, you know, well, you know, this is a greeting, it's almost impossible to say, well, how do you greet in Spanish, in English, right? Or, you know, there is not so much hierarchy in Spanish. It's a very democratic, country in the way that people talk, is it the same? So yes, doing that um, connection to your L1 is essential. We used to, and I haven't entered in this one because a little bit um, still people are talk, starting to talk about it, but in pragmatics, we used to talk about uh, L1 positive transfer and L1 negative transfer. So when you transfer uh, something that it's, you know, okay in your language, and then you do it in, in another language, we used to call it L2 transfer, negative transfer. So me trying to kiss everybody in the United States is <laughs> negative transfer, right? Mm -hmm. But now we're talking a little bit more in applied linguistics at, uh, um, about translanguaging, right? Mm -hmm. And how people use different languages to do what they want. And pragmatics is part of it. So the pragmatics community is starting to think about how do we fit in that translanguaging new paradigm, right? Because, you know, using different languages helps you, you know, communicate in the way that you want to communicate, but using different pragmatics has a different type of impact. Mm -hmm. So it's not resolved yet. It, it's just a studying. It, it's something that, you know, the, like I was saying, the, the pragmatic community is starting to think, well, how do we look into these translanguage and transpragmatic thing and, and see how that works, right? Mm -hmm. So, yeah. um, yes, but, you know, L1 and L2 or L1, L2, L3, L4, uh, yeah. that, you know, it, it's, it's, yeah, it's very important. Thank you. And students sometimes don't even know. They don't recognize it. They go, oh, yeah. Yeah. oh, that's true. We do that. Mm -hmm. So that awareness raising, you know, mm -hmm. essential in their L1 too, yes. Mm -hmm. We have a question from Sylvia. In what ways can we stress to our students the difference in language registers in sociolinguistic context of assessment and in everyday context? Um, I think by practicing different contexts, right? Um, again, seeing examples of different contexts, how people interact linguistically and non-linguistically, right, in, in different in different contexts. So showing your students, you know, a different a greeting between friends, a greeting in a business setting, a greeting under the rain, a greeting in a bar. So all of these different ways of doing things, talking about them, talking, you know, like Pablo was mentioning about how do you do it in your L1? Is it the same? Is it different? and just showing a variety of contexts. That's another reason why I think it's so important to get the students to interact with other people outside of their context. Here, for example, in Hawaii, we have very few Spanish speakers. I could send students to Waikiki and they hear Japanese, Chinese, Korean everywhere, but no Spanish. 
hardly know Spanish. So they can interact with anybody in different contexts with people that they don't know, right? I'm the teacher, they know me. Their, their, their classmates, they know. So hardly ever they can encounter new people, right? And do some of these pragmatics work. So telecollaborations, you know, and meeting other people online, um, it's a great way to do that. Or engaging people in forums, for example, in Reddit, in, in things where they have to meet people from the first time and use language for the first time. So a variety of contexts, exposing them to it, I think is, is the only way that they really can, can do it. When you assess, it depends what you want to assess, right? Some teachers don't assess every point of grammar. It is one thing you're assessing. If you come from a task-based approach like I do, then the assessment is the task and the student do the task, right? So that task comes with a context. Is that a student himself buying a ticket with a person they don't know because he's in a ticket booth, for example, right? So the, the context comes given by the task itself. If I may, I would like to follow up on something that you have said um, about the use of telecollaboration to for students to teach pragmatics and to for students to interact with members from another culture and learn how the language works. But we have also been in those situations in which there have been some communication breakdowns precisely because of how the speakers of the two different languages express the same idea in very different ways or what has been provided as a suggestion or a help or a grammatical correction to do better in the language has been taken as being too assertive and too um, and paternalistic to some extent. So this is more of a comment of how the instructors have to, when they are engaged in these telecollaborations, bring the, the interactions that are taking place to the classroom to address those mismatch, those miscommunications that happen to not reinforce precisely the stereotypes that you have talked about in your presentation. Yes, totally agree. Um, how to repair miscommunications is one of those activities that every student should do because every student is going to make, miscommunicate, right? So understanding how people see your miscommunications and being able to react to it. So that interactional pragmatics I was talking about Right? It's been able to, I mean, you think this is going right and I'm doing everything right and then suddenly they correct me and I'm like, oh, excuse me, it was correct. Right? So um, knowing what to do and what to say or what not to say, sometimes it's what not to say, right? That, um, that needs work. And definitely if you have a possibility of bringing a student's interaction into class from re for reflective practice, then that's, that's a great source of, of content to talk about pragmatics. So if you have done it or if you're doing any type of interaction, bring it to class, right? Look at it, Why is what's happening here? Why is this happening here, right? And you know, how can we fix it? And how can we not do it again? And so bringing those um, examples to class, great source of material. Mm -hmm. We, we also have a comment from Curtis. It says, thank you for this fantastic presentation, Marta. I'm not sure if mine is a question applicable to this conversation or not, but I wonder if we are speaking of new paradigms, how do you suggest conversations about pronoun identification instead of using he, him, for example, a student in the US uses they, them. I wonder if this is a practice in Spanish and if it is not, how do we enter into that conversation for the students learning a language where that is not a common practice? Very good topic, yeah. And I didn't go into it on purpose. Yeah, that's in, in pragmatics, it's called the ictics. So it's how people use some words to identify things, right? So it's totally a part of pragmatics. Um, I think, I think it's, I, I feel like I'm repeating myself all the time here, but um, I think talking to students about it, right? They're, they're smart people. Students are not, you know, they understand things. So, you know, um, is this, this is similar to the issue that in Spain um, is happening about 
uh, putting words that were never feminine into feminine forms now, right? Or using the masculine and the feminine one after the other. So, you know, getting the masculine not to generalize anymore, right? Those are pragmatic issues too with the language. So talking about it, what does it mean? You know, what's behind it, right? How can we, um, you know, observe what the person is using first, right? If you are in a conference and people have their pronouns here, well, then, you know, you know that that is a pragmatic clue for you to use those pronouns, for example, right? Since the Spanish is not in the Eleia, some people are, I, I've seen people where, you know, they say um, she, her, ella, la, in, in their tags and things like that. So I think it may be catching up. But I would basically talk about them and see, you know, same thing in their L1. How do you address, how do you do it in their L1? There's people still that don't know how to do it. I mean, I've, I've been in conferences where people were like totally confused. And now, you know, when I go to say, hey, you, what the, hey, they, you know, they, they, you know, don't know how to do it. So we can learn in our L1 how to do it properly. And then if it is done in Spain, then bring a reading about it, bring a video of someone talking about it, uh, you know, develop meta pragmatic awareness uh, about it and then if you can practice a little bit you know give everybody a different tag and okay it's the beginning of the conference reception and you are meeting as many people as you can because you're looking for a job so go introduce yourselves and ask people one or two questions and depending on their you know pronouns that they decide to have then have people interact as a little activity I do not see any more questions. Oh, there's one. Oh, Tomenada Puzelano? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, you want me to read Anna? Or yes. You... Okay. Uh, would you argue that when working on translation, adding a translation brief to the text, the students must, trans must translate it in a good way to introduce practice pragmatics in translation? where we are more limited in the skills, we can practice within the given source text? That's a very good question. I, I have this discussion often with one of my colleagues in, in translation, right? I'll give you her, to, her, her point of view because she's the expert in, in, in this case. Um, for her, she always tells me, well, you know, if, if you're translating something, that is translatable directly, why adding to it, right? Now, if there is something in the pragmatics of that translation that is invisible in the other language, then she says, yes, she is um, in favor of adding something, either you know a mark or a brief or something to it. But she says that many times you are able to translate something capture the pragmatics of a translation by translating in a certain way. That's what she tells me. I'm not a translation expert, but I don't know if that answers your, your question there. So maybe thinking more about how you're translating things and thinking about, okay, what is the context of this translation, right? How would people be saying this thing in this context under the rain, you know, may not be a direct, direct translation, but it may make more sense in the language that you're translating, people would do it rather than they would say it, right? They would do it like this. Thank you, Marta. We have one final question here from Julissa. Hola, Marta. ¿Aconsejas implementar en la, en la evaluación diagnóstica aspectos pragmáticos? Um, sí, siempre, I mean, siempre es bueno saber cuánto saben tus estudiantes. As it's it's always you know um, if they know more then you know what you can do with them so um, yeah and you can you don't have to do it in a very formal way you can just do it you know in do a role play and so um, you can do it in a role play and see how they do something that will give you an idea as as a diagnostic of how they can do some things so you don't have to do a formal thing. There are tools out there. Um, there's websites. There's an excellent website, although it's a little old, but has lots of videos, lots of activities. It's called um, uh, 
Mm. Something with words. I'll, I'll look for it. I can, we can put it in the in the chat. Uh, it was created actually by Julie Sykes and um, is part of um, the Castle um, mm -hmm. Center. And um, they um, they have different speech acts. They have activities. They have videos. So you could have students do a couple of those um, as a diagnostic form. But yeah, and even in their L1, how, how pragmatically appropriate they are in their own L1 also. Mm -hmm. Dancing with words, sorry. Just <laughs> dancing with words. I was looking for it as you were speaking. I was trying to get it. <laughs> I couldn't think of it either. Well, I think that we are approaching the time. Uh, Marta, you've been talking nonstop for an hour and, and a half. So I think we've been abusing the speaker a lot. <laughs> so I don't think there are any more questions, but in, from my part, thank you, Marta. I mean, like always in, inspiring. Uh, I, I I think that the word generosity uh, is being seen in this presentation because she's giving us her email so we can all write to her and she can give us extra information. And so from my part, thank you very much, Marta. It's always a pleasure to see you. Yeah. My pleasure. Yeah. Th yes. thank, thank you very, very much, Marta, for, for this wonderful talk. You can see that it, it has aroused a lot of interest to many, many questions. But as Idoya was saying, we don't want to abuse more your time today. <laughs> <laughs> no. uh, so, and thank you, Anna and Idoya, as well, for being such a good coordinators. And thank you to everyone who attended today. And I just want to remind you that the recording will be available on the YouTube channel. I don't know exactly when, but soon. Uh, 